It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning, if slightly ironic. Um, I'm a lay person and I don't enjoy preaching myself. Uh, but I suppose my qualifications for doing this are that I love the Bible and I'm always amazed at how much there is to be found there, particularly when we share it together, and that I do listen to a lot of sermons. Um, and uh, what I hate if I've been listening to a sermon is coming away thinking, what was the point of that? That's not something you ever want people leaving your sermons, asking themselves, what was the point of that? Um, there are very bad answers to what's the point of this sermon I've just been listening to. One is um, the sermon was designed to make me like the preacher better or uh, the sermon looked and sounded like therapy for the preacher. Or the sermon was primarily meant to be entertaining. You, you all know the kinds of sermons I mean. Um, it's always quite telling if you can remember the illustration, but not what it was supposed to be illustrating. I remember, for example, um, somebody when I was undergraduate throwing a beach ball out of the pulpit into the congregation. You can see I can remember the beach ball. I cannot remember what the sermon was about. Um, I also remember um, a sermon which was uh, about the persecution of Christians and the primary illustration was a a dispute about the fencing between the vicarage and the vicarage's neighbours. Uh, and again, I couldn't really see that that was um, a deeply edifying sermon content. Um, it's easy to be critical and, <laughs> and to, let's be honest, quite fun. Um, but uh, what then do I think is the point of a sermon? Um, I, I'd like to suggest three things and you've all got your own ideas which are equally um, valid so don't feel you have to take any notice of me. Um, when I'm listening to a sermon I would like to be helped to understand the biblical passage better. Um, in theory preachers are the ones who have been trained and equipped in biblical theology so that they can enable others uh, to to get more deeply into the narrative and understand it. Uh, and it's particularly helpful, I think, um, if you're preaching on a scriptural text to see, to help the congregation see it um, in a broader context, in the broader context of the book from which that passage is taken, um, but also in the broader context of the whole bib biblical narrative. Um, we all know that the New Testament was written by people who know the Old Testament very well. Uh, and who also don't expect us um, to do what we now do with the lectionary, which is just to bring out little snippets. Um, and uh, we do make our snippets very small uh, in the way that we uh, enable our congregations to engage with the Bible. Um, and uh, even if you are a lectionary based church, which not all churches are now, um, we uh, nonetheless cut it into very small pieces and people aren't necessarily there day by day and week by week. So they don't get a sense of how uh, the, the passage that we're preaching on um, fits into the whole narrative. So first thing, um, help people understand how this particular passage fix, fits into the wider biblical narrative. And secondly, following on from that, help us to understand um, that we are part of this big narrative. Um, uh, um, it's always a very frightening thing to ask people why they come to church because they might stop and think, hmm, why do I come to church? Um, but actually, uh, the, the, the coming to church, being church, is part of uh, engaging with the whole of God's huge narrative, God's action and, and purpose uh, for the world. Uh, and if we don't help people engage with that, it can make church seem very small and pointless. So um, help people understand their part in the big narrative. And then thirdly, um, help people make connections with the, the biblical passage that you're preaching on, uh, and connections to their own lives. And Lent, it seems to me, is, is full of the kind of grand themes that give us lots of opportunities to explore those three things uh, in relation to Jesus's mission and our own calling. Um, so I thought it might be fun to have a little go at seeing what those principles might look like if applied um, to a reading for the first Sunday of Lent. Um, and uh, let's have a little look at what the first Sunday of Lent actually um, enables us to see. Uh, it's it's, it's um, the gospel reading is Mark 1, 9 to 15. So if we're going to put it uh, in its context, we need to remind people that uh, that it's part of Mark's prologue. We don't usually call it that, but it actually is part of the prologue. And there are real parallels with the prologue to St. John's Gospel. It talks about the beginning. Um, it declares that Jesus is the Son of God, 
uh, and that he's the beloved son of God. And it tells us about John the Baptist as the forerunner and very clearly only the forerunner. So in verse one, um, Mark announces that this is good news. Um, that word is gospel, obviously. Um, uh, but gospel is not at this point when Mark is writing is not actually a technical term yet. Mark seems actually to have invented the genre more or less. But uh, Mark's first audience would have been hearing and thinking um, a kind of heraldic announcement of something that people need to hear, like the coming of the emperor or success for the nation in battle, something that's going to affect their lives when they hear this announcement um, of uh, the good news. Um, Mark, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I was brought up believing in um, Mark and the messianic secret because he's on in Mark's gospel. Jesus often tells people not to tell others when he's healed them or done something for them. Um, but here in the prologue, it's very, very openly declared that Jesus is uh, the Messiah. This is uh, about Jesus, the Christ. Um, so this is the good news of God's coming Messiah. Um, John the Baptist, a uh, key figure um, uh, and uh, clearly depicted more, more particularly by Luke than by Mark, but I think taken for granted by all the Gospels that John the Baptist is playing the kind of role that Samuel played um, in relation to David is uh, called to anoint, to baptise uh, the new messianic king. So this is a messianic action as uh, John the Baptist baptises um, Jesus. And so the, our actual, so that's putting it in its wider context in the prologue there. Um, our actual um, uh, gospel starts on with verse nine. Our actual gospel reading for today starts with verse nine. Um, uh, and uh, verse nine says this is happening in Galilee. Now, actually, again, if you notice in Mark's gospel, uh, pretty well the, that Galilee is the setting for pretty well the whole of the first half of uh, Mark's gospel. Um, ancient Christian authorities um, uh, called Mark's gospel uh, the eyewitness account of St Peter um, and obviously there's a huge amount of toing and froing about uh, how reliable that tradition actually is um, but uh, recent work looking at the kind of journeys and the narratives um, of the first half of Mark's gospel have in some senses reinforced that um, feeling that this that we might be hearing something of Peter's account of that the beginning of that ministry. It's a very much a fisherman's account. The journeys make more sense if you're going by boat, apparently, than if you're uh, traveling on foot. Um, and uh, part of the argument um, put forward by some recent scholars is that the Gospels are keen for us to see them as eyewitness accounts, that they're not just made up, that actually there's historical background to what is being said. Um, and uh, after this prologue that we're looking at today, St Mark's Gospel is quite careful always to tell us who is witnessing what is being described. So look out for that as you go through the Gospel. Look out for who is actually there, whose testimony are we hearing? And if you notice, Peter is there for pretty well the whole of the Gospel narrative. Uh, and for the moments when Peter isn't there, we're always told who else is there that the early Christian community would know. Um, so beyond our Gospel passage today in verse 16, here comes St Peter uh, beginning to tell us his account. Um, the baptism of Jesus clearly is uh, in all of the Gospels. Um, uh, all of them uh, give testimony of the, the voice that is heard, uh, of the presence of the dove. Um, Mark doesn't have any embarrassment whatsoever about Jesus undergoing a baptism for repentance and forgiveness. Um, if you look at Matthew, in Matthew 3, Matthew is embarrassed by it and therefore explains why it has to happen. Uh, but Mark uh, simply tells us that it does happen. So um, let's have another little look at our next section. So if we look at um, verses 12 and 13, um, there's a great sense of urgency immediately after the baptism, immediately uh, Jesus is driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and you, throughout the St Mark's Gospel, there's this huge sense of things moving at a colossal pace. Jesus constantly busy, constantly surrounded, that sense of urgency of the Gospel uh, and Jesus's mission. And uh, Mark simply says that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. He doesn't give us 
uh, the lengthy descriptions of the temptations that we find in Matthew and Luke. But we are told that he's tempted by Satan um, and that he's tempted for 40 days. And that 40 days, is, we often um, narrate that as paralleling the 40 years of uh, the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness. But perhaps more significantly, we could see the parallels with um, Moses's 40 days, um, Exodus 34, 28, where Moses is receiving um, uh, the law, taking down the law, or that um, very uh, pivotal moment in Elijah's ministry in 1 Kings 19, 8, where again, he spends 40 days um, rediscovering and renewing his uh, prophetic calling um, and I, I think that the I think this is these are the parallels we're actually meant to see uh, in in that 40 days reference because uh, it can't be a coincidence can it that Moses and Elijah return again at the time of the transfiguration so um, here they are um, in the background of the 40 days of tempting in the wilderness and then they uh, re-emerge at the time when Jesus is going to face the massive temptation uh, to avoid uh, the necessary calling to his crucifixion and death. Um, Satan is always a fun one to think about how you might preach about Satan in a way that helps people put it in a, a wider context than the one that they might be assuming when they hear the word Satan. Um, Job, for example, gives Satan uh, the, the kind of role as a, a, you might call an investigative um, prosecutor. He's given a job to go out and see if he can trip Job up. Um, in Jewish apocalyptic writing, um, Satan begins to emerge much more as the leader of forces that oppose God's people, um, uh, building perhaps on 1 Chronicles 21.1. Satan's role is to stop us being the people of God in some way or another, to find out our weaknesses in such a way that we abandon our reality, which is that we are the people of God. Um, and uh, so um, help people understand who Satan is and the various possible interpretations of Satan's role uh, within the scriptural narrative. Um, we're told that uh, he was with the wild beasts, Jesus was with the wild beasts in the desert. Um, and we could think of Psalm 91 there, um, a psalm of the Lord's protection. But it also has, of course, echoes for us of um, 1 Corinthians 15, 32, where Paul says that he wrestled with wild beasts at Ephesus. Um, and uh, those wild beasts, are, we're pretty sure, are meant to be um, symbolic beasts. I don't think he's actually talking about being put into the arena. I think he's talking about um, uh, the kind of beasts that attack us, that draw us into that um, battle between good and evil. And again, we're told that angels waited on him, uh, waited on Jesus in the wilderness. Um, and therefore, that sense of, of, of being... Um, of this being a necessary part of Jesus's calling, this wilderness episode. It's not actually, he hasn't been abandoned by God uh, in order to suffer this on his own. He has been, he has the angelic protection still around him. Uh, and then um, verses 14 and 15, um, the kingdom of God as the theme of Jesus's preaching and presence. Mark, um, throughout his gospel, presents Jesus as teaching with authority, as healing, as exorcising, as forgiving, um, um, so that wherever Jesus goes, we see the rule of God. Um, but uh, also Mark requires us to notice how Jesus exercises that rule. Uh, what does the rule of God actually look like? We're going to be asked as disciples of Christ, as followers of Christ, to let Jesus show us what God's rule is like and not to require Jesus to rule in the way that we would like um, and we would like God uh, to rule on our behalf. Um, so some really interesting possible uh, ways of uh, helping people see uh, the, this particular gospel passage in its own context and in the context of the wider um, biblical narrative. If, if we were to think about how we might want to make connections well there are all kinds of things that we um, could do but it seems to me there are three 
um, possible themes that would be really helpful for us to think about during Lent. Um, one is the whole wilderness theme. Um, uh, and th th this is such a good time to be thinking about wilderness. Everybody feels we are in such a wilderness, uh, lost all markers, um, uh, uh, everything that we've relied upon being taken away from us. So this sense of um, how we might explore the wilderness uh, and you could do that from uh, the Old Testament perspective of uh, the wilderness, the 40 years in the wilderness, as a time when um, God's people discover who and what they are. Uh, you, you see them leaving Egypt as a, a bunch of really um, ill-disciplined slaves, uh, not used to self-determination and constantly uh, uh, complaining that they're not getting their needs met. And then by the end of those uh, 40 years of very considerable uh, toing and froing and temptation and uh, uh, and loss, uh, they have become a victorious nation. They become a people. Um, so that wilderness uh, theme in the Old Testament. Or you might approach the wilderness theme uh, perhaps through the great desert tradition in spirituality. Um, some wonderful, wonderful writing um, on the desert fathers and desert ma desert mothers, the sayings, the, the, the kind of um, call uh, to ensure that the wilderness stays at the heart of how we witness to the coming of God, that we don't get too reconciled and too comfortable in the world that we're actually in, but that we constantly remember um, that there is another kingdom coming, another way of living coming. Uh, and so the desert tradition is is very much not just about personal asceticism, um, but about joining in that great battle um, between the, the forces of good and evil, uh, of lending ourselves to that battle as we submit to uh, the desert spirituality. So I think the wilderness theme would be a really interesting one uh, to bring out and help people make connections during Lent. Um, you could pick up the baptism theme. All the gospels tell us um, that Jesus was baptised. The epistles tell us that baptism is part of the earliest Christian practice um, uh, that we find uh, among Jesus' disciples. Um, it's a constant part of Christian practice of every tradition and denomination. Uh, and again, hugely helpful Lent themes if you wanted to take uh, the theme of baptism and how it, we die to ourselves and are risen in Christ kind of new life that we're entering into so that um, the, the tradition of giving things up at Lent um, becomes something really positive. It's about growing uh, the new life that Christ has offered to us in baptism. It's also never a bad idea, I think, to teach again about uh, the centrality of baptism and, and the entering into uh, the new people of God through baptism. So you could pick up the baptism theme, perhaps. Um, uh, as part of that preaching of this uh, Lent gospel. Or perhaps finally, you could um, pick up where our gospel reading ends, um, and that is with the kingdom of God. Um, what, what is the kingdom of God? Um, how do we relate to it as church? It's um, at the heart of Jesus's teaching and ministry. Uh, it's the thing that, um, that that St Mark tells us has drawn near as Jesus comes to us. So what is it? Um, it it's a, a, a theme that enables the church to rediscover who, it, who we are and what we are called to. So that principle that I, I want to argue for of, of enabling us to see ourselves as part of the big action of God from beginning to end, from creation to fulfilment. Kingdom themes really help there. And they also help the church, help us as church to begin to uh, um, to have some principles by which we determine our action. Uh, so you might want to think about um, how you uh, how you would preach about the kingdom of God during Lent. So um, those are my ideas. Uh, and I think some of you will be preaching on this gospel passage really quite soon. Um, uh, and uh, I will uh, look forward to hearing how that goes. Thank you for listening to me. Goodbye.